Welcome back. Well, the bank Nifty is once again in the green. Nifty is almost there. The mid caps once again seeing selling pressure. Just pull out the advanced decline once again. And it's 1 is to 2 already in favor of the decline. So but there's perhaps a bit of an early warning uh, on, the, on the broader market once again. It's been underperforming this month. And that continues to be the case even today as well. Gautam Dugard is joining us now, head of research at uh, Motilal Oswal Financial Services. Gautam, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so what's been your verdict of the earnings season, Gautam? Uh, have, you know, how many upgrades and how many downgrades? Hi, Aruj. Uh, good morning. So earnings season has been quite good, uh, Anuj, especially the second half. Uh, I mean, if I were to just summarize it in one word, we have seen Nifty earnings almost double YOI, though on a low base, but the expectations were of 94, 95% growth. So a marginal beat. And for our broader universe of Motila Losal coverage uh, of 208 stocks, we have seen an earnings growth of 117%, which is broadly in line. Right. And, uh, you know, this this uh, estimate, uh, this performance has been led by uh, commodities and cyclicals. Uh, if I were to point out metals and OMCs, which have driven the beat, X of those two sectors, numbers are marginally ahead of estimates. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we have seen uh, in terms of quantity, the number of downgrades have been higher than the number of upgrades. But at the margin, we have not seen any change in the Nifty EPS estimate. They are very stable, 732 and 865, which is what we had at the time of preview also. So there has not been any damage uh, despite the uh, lethal second wave. Uh, we have not seen any damage in the Nifty earnings estimate for the next two years. So we are still expecting 30% plus earnings growth for FY22 and somewhere about 17, 18% for FY23. So that's been the uh, sum and substance of uh, this earnings season, mm -hmm. led by cyclicals. Okay, Gautam, hi, good morning. I'll come back to earnings in a bit, but I do want to talk about the listing of the moment because that's what's grabbing all the eyeballs right now, Devyani International. Uh, it's trading at, I think, 133. Let's just get it up for you, which is what, a 45%, 50% up move from its issue price. Uh, we are getting a lot of queries right now, Gautam, about people that have not got allotment, retail investors, and what to do post-listing. Uh, what's your advice? So without uh, specifically commenting on Devyani, I would say that QSR is a space which is very exciting. And we've been positive on this space. We had uh, uh, recently upgraded uh, Jubilant also somewhere about 3,000 rupees. Uh, clearly, uh, Sonia COVID-19 has acted as a tailwind for the branded QSR players and more so on the delivery side, which is what the results of Burger King, uh, McDonald's, Jubilant and a, you know, uh, other uh, companies operating in this space has been reflecting. And this is a very long-term uh, growth-oriented category where I think the shift from unbranded to branded uh, because of the unfortunate event of COVID-19 will continue. And delivery has become mainstream now. I don't expect delivery contribution to go down meaningfully even as dining comes up. So dining won't cannibalize the delivery uh, segment in the QSR space. So this is a very exciting space for the next three, five, 10 years. Uh, so if somebody has a long-term view, one must definitely have some exposure to the QSR space. Well, that's an important point that dining will not cannibalize the delivery part of it for a lot of these uh, QSR companies, food tech companies. Gautam, good morning. Uh, now, I want to go back to the point you were making on uh, sort of the market-wide numbers on earnings and the fact that estimates have not uh, been impacted by the second wave. So in terms of valuations, we're at what, 21 times or 22 times, uh, you know, forward earnings. The question is, do you see more scope for expansion given the strong uh, manner in which the earnings have been shaping up? So it's quite possible because the backdrop for liquidity and interest rates still remains very conducive for the equity valuations. And if earnings don't see disappointment, I think there is no reason for anybody to just go and sell because we have seen that just valuations do not drive upside or downside in the markets, whether it is a sector-wise, stock-wise, or, or at an aggregate market-wise levels. So if earnings momentum continue like this, then obviously uh, markets can stand where it is. The point is, uh, in a couple of months, people will start using FY23 as an anchor for equity valuations again. So second half moment we cross September, which I think is a month away, 
in another one or two months, people will start basing their valuations on FY23 numbers. If the confidence for FY22 numbers remain high, given that we have seen first quarter of this year delivering the numbers, meeting the expectations, and if we see something similar continue in 2Q FY22, then obviously this is the confidence about the earnings cycle having turned because FY21, we have seen the best earnings in a decade, and that is being followed by a 35% kind of a growth year in FY22. So clearly the momentum would have turned on earnings and people will have confidence that this cycle can last for a couple of years because the underlying macro fundamentals remain quite strong too. Sectors which had hitherto not participated in the earnings story for last five or six years, they are uh, you know, contributing now. So yes, I mean, valuations are not cheap at 22 times FY22 and about 18, 19 times FY23. But if earnings momentum continue like this and we don't see any damage on the interest rate liquidity environment, which is providing a solid backdrop for equity valuations, then yes, market can still continue uh, its support journey. What about banks? Uh, we had the highest quarterly pat in 23 quarters, uh, uh, Gautam, at aggregate level. But uh, uh, your, your thoughts on which ones uh, really stood out? So, yeah, I mean, no, actually, Anuj, uh, just to correct you there, we have we had the highest quarterly pat in March 21 quarter. Sequentially, the earnings are down 15, 16% because of the lockdowns that we had seen in April and May. Uh, yes, so as far as sectors are concerned, we have seen wheat from cement, oil and gas. Uh, I would say even uh, smaller sectors like specialty chemicals, they've beaten estimates. Metals met the expectations, but the expectations itself were very elevated. So I would account metals as a big, big uh, contributor because they've been the biggest contributor for last two quarters in incremental growth. And we're expecting metals to contribute again, one third of the earnings growth in Nifty for FY22. Then consumer, IT, pharma uh, met the expectations. What has disappointed is auto and capital goods. The auto has been a big disappointment. Almost all companies uh, saw big cuts and I expect more earnings downgrade there in rest of the year again. So that is the spread of the sector as far as earnings for this quarter is concerned, largely led by metals and big sectors like private bank, IT, consumer, pharma meeting the expectations. On metals, uh, just a follow-up on what you said. I mean, the earnings have met expectations and we've all seen how Tata Steel's numbers have shaped up. But at what stage of the upcycle are we at? You think it's reached a mature stage or is there still a lot more juice for investors? Uh, Sonia, it's a very tough question to answer because the very volatile sectors and then uh, global and commodities. At the moment, the prices which are prevailing in the underlying commodities give you the confidence that at least the first half of the earnings for this sector is secure. And in this sector, you have to take quarter by quarter outlook depending on where the prices are. Uh, as far as we are concerned in all our metals uh, models, our estimates for the prices are somewhere about 5 to 10% discount to the prevailing commodity prices. Or to flip it other way, if I were to put the prevailing commodity prices in our model, our target prices and estimates will see 20, 25% upside because there is also a deleveraging angle which is coming in uh, in almost all of the stocks right from FY21 and that is continuing even now. So yes, I mean, uh, prices at the moment do not give you any concern, uh, neither is the valuation because obviously the prices are what uh, we will determine the valuations and earnings also. So, yeah, I mean, we will have to relook at it again if, after every quarter uh, and then decide because these are very uh, volatile, volatile and cyclical sectors. Okay. So, uh, Gautam, uh, uh, looking ahead, finally, uh, where do you, or which one sector do you think one needs to keep a sharp eye on where there is still possibility of perhaps the highest uh, upgrades, more pleasant surprises? Uh, I am I'm very positive on financials, uh, Surbi. Uh, last three quarters, 3Q, 4Q and 1Q FY22 has demonstrated that the balance sheets of the large banks has not gotten impacted too much. I'm talking about large cap financials, uh, including banks and NBFCs. And uh, given the relative underperformance of the stocks over the last 15 to 18 months, the valuations have also corrected. And uh, I do expect that the credit cost will decline from here and your credit growth will improve. And as the economic activity improves, you will also see some element of fee income growth coming in too. So combination of these three, four factors keeps us very positive on large cap financials, which is why we are continuing with a 300 bips overweight on financials in our model portfolio. 
And if I may, the second sector where we continue to remain very positive is IT. That has done very well uh, in the last two years. And I think this is the single largest beneficiary of COVID-19, given the way it deals, uh, deal momentum, order book, and the whole uh, shift towards digital transformation is going on. Both large cap and mid caps have delivered good results and have seen earnings upgrade also in some cases. While mid caps are clearly now more expensive than large caps, so our preference will continue toward large cap IT. And even in IT, we are about 350 bips overweight. So these are the two sectors from a, a large cap point of view where we are uh, very positive. Okay, mm -hmm. what about pharma, Gautam? The large cap pharma, where there has clearly been some pricing pressure. We've seen that with Lupin, Aurobindo, Dr. Reddy's. Uh, any thoughts here? Yeah, so Anuj, uh, that I agree. You know, you've seen big pricing pressure that has resulted in earnings downgrade and earnings misses. Okay, well, there seems to be a bit of an issue with the video there. Uh, yes, go ahead, Gautam. Yeah. Two quarters back, we had reduced sun and lipid there. Yeah. So uh, we are neutral in our model portfolio on healthcare and uh, our preferred ideas there are gland and DPs. Right, we will leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining us and uh, chatting about the earnings season as well as about some of these new listings that are having a good time so far. Devyani is now, ha has now, uh, you know, petered off a little bit. The high that it hit uh, in the opening trade, Devyani International, was 141. Now it's come down a little bit to about 125. So big moves there. Krishna Diagnostics as well, 10% higher. Uh, and a couple of others will also show up for you on your screen. But let's shift focus now to the commodity markets. Uh, Manisha Gupta, our commodities editor, is here to give us the latest there. Manisha, hi, morning. Morning, Sonia. Thank you for that. Well, I'm looking at the gold prices. You know, last Monday we were trading at around $16, $80 per ounce. We are almost at $17, $80 in the international markets there. And the Indian price is just about nudging that 47000 mark here as well. So it's a one-week highs and we have seen the gold price has gained up by nearly one and a half percent in the previous week. The buying has come in on back of various concerns and opportunities because it's looking stronger on the technical charts. We have seen, as I said, in five working days, we've seen hundred dollars of a jump up come in case of the gold prices. 1780 continues to be a stiff resistance. Once we cross that, the markets believe that 1800 would just be a target. Then the central bank buying has been quite strong. RBI itself has been one of the major top buyers in the last one year when you look at the gold prices. And then the economic data has not been so strong. So whether it is the U.S. consumer confidence numbers, which are at a decade lows, or the Chinese industrial production numbers, which are at an 11-month lows, lower than what the street was expecting as well. The markets also are looking at the geopolitical implications of the Afghan government collapse. We also have seen the Delta variant for COVID numbers has been increasing. There are more restrictions coming in. Uneven recoveries are various of the reasons that people have gotten back in case of gold for buying there. There's plenty to watch out for. You have the U.S. Fed minutes coming in on Wednesday. There is a Jackson Hole meeting on August 26 to 28th as well. And you also have a Powell testimony coming in tomorrow. So plenty to watch out for in sense of numbers and data to impact the gold prices there. But it is a buy that we've gotten in from the brokerages. I spoke to IFL and they have a target on upside for gold at around 47,300. A sell though on, on crude oil prices just about continues. And on the lower side, 4,950 could be seen on charts. Okay, got that, Manisha. Thank you very much for the details on the commodity side. Markets on the equity side are still fairly flat. We will take a quick break right now. On the other side, Nikhil Chopra, the CEO and whole-time director at JB Chemicals will join in. We'll talk about their first quarter performance. <laughs> 